Awesome. Okay. Thank you, really, for everybody for joining in live. We are continuing our shiur tonight on tefillah. And in our uh, progress, we've reached the point of studying the Kaddish. Last week, to summarize, what we looked at was the early history of Kaddish. And how, just to summarize, we had sources for a prayer of Yehei Shmei Rabba from the Talmudic era. Many Midrashim, many Gemarot, which men mention a prayer of Yehei Shmei Rabba. And Kaddish, as we noted, most, let me pin, sorry, let me pin myself. Kaddish, as we noted, um, has all the hallmarks of a prayer that is not a prayer designed by the Beit for the Beit Knesset. Rather, it is a prayer designed for the study hall. Some uh, some would call this a tefillat Beit Hamidrash, right? A, a a prayer of base medrash origin. This tefillah doesn't seem to have been written as a petitionary prayer. This 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 uh, doxology, this kaddish, this 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 praise unit seems to have been been designed to be used at the conclusion of learning in the study hall. That's what we we examined last week. Just like other prayers like Yekum Purkan or Al HaKol Yitkadal Kadash or Uva Litzion, Yitkadal Kadash Shemer is a messianic doxology. It's a, it's a conclusion to the studies which mentions the coming of Mashiach with hopeful if with hope for salvation and in their time they would call such a prayer a nechemata right this was their type of prayer and it's mentioned in the kaddish right um the uh, that we more than any nechemata we could say to god so this was the background we studied last week that that the kaddish is in its origin most likely a a relic from the study hall, much like other similar uh, prayers that were used to conclude the studies. Now, this doesn't explain how it got into the liturgy proper. One theory we explored, um, which is from this is from your from Yisrael Tashma, is that perhaps the Kaddish was attached to the Baruch Hu, uh, in one of the prayers, at least by Shachrit, and before the Baruch Hu, somehow, somewise, somebody decided to introduce the Baruch Hu with a Kaddish. It could be because there was a learning session before the davening. Whatever it was, the Kaddish became attached to Baruch Hu, so much so that in the earliest sources of a Kaddish, we always see it called Kaddishu Baruch Hu. And perhaps that's how it was infected into the liturgy proper. We find Kaddish already in Masechet Sofrim. It's mentioned by name. In the Sechet Sofrim, which is from the six or seven hundreds in the Gaonic times in Eretz Yisrael, so we know that Kaddish entered the liturgy pretty early. Exactly how we don't know. There is some additional work that's been on done on this by Andreas uh, Lenart also to try to explore this era, this early era about when Kaddish became specifically a part of the liturgy. But his conclusions aren't very different than mm -hmm. than uh, what's been done until now. And honestly, I um. The methodology is just is just a little bit more sophisticated, um, but regardless, that's where we're holding. We're holding after introducing Kaddish as a rabbinic prayer. So, uh, let me let me just let this person join. Okay, now, so if we've introduced Kaddish as such, we still have many other types of Kaddish to explore. How, for example, do we come? to a place where how do we come to a place where we find other forms of Kaddish like Kaddish Durabanan specifically Kaddish Yeshlama Chatsi Kaddish Kaddish Yatom we have to explore how the Kaddish evolved over time into its multiple types of forms now the most famous of the Kaddishes right the most the most famous form and the one that is most imprinted on everybody's um, on everyone's psychology is, of course, the Kaddish Yatom. The Kaddish Yatom, or so-called the Mourner's Kaddish, is a Jewish ritual, which is ex extremely famous, of course, that, let me share my screen here. The Kaddish Yatom is a ritual 
where a person who loses a, a very close relative, like a parent, a child, a sibling, someone who Lo'alein loses, a person like that will say Kaddish for that person, uh, typically after davening. When they go to, the, to, 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 to pray with a minyan, they will go ahead and say, let me just readmit Ab Avner, sorry. They will go ahead and, and um, they will go, those people will, will say the Kaddish in front of the congregation and the congregation will answer Amen. So this is yet another evolution. First, we have the the, the Kaddish is, is designed to, to hope for Mashiach after learning Torah. Then it becomes used as an introduction to Baruch Hu. Then it becomes used to bridge parts of Tfilais throughout the Siddur. Now suddenly we have this situation, and it's pretty early already, where, and, and we'll discuss the sources in a second. I'm going to admit one more person. Okay, so now we have a situation <coughs> where the Kaddish suddenly has become about the Atomim, about the mourners, and about people who have lost somebody. So how did this come to be? How did it become that the Kaddish is suddenly associated with either death, the dead people, or burial. Like, how did Kaddish suddenly become a part of, of, um, how did Kaddish become a part of, of the Jewish psychology around death? So the first uh, ideas which have been thrown out were, of course, that, of course, Kaddish inside of it says nothing about death. Kaddish is only speaking about grandifying Hashem's name, uh, in the future, and that how Hashem's name should be praised. Rather, the Kaddish, because it's speaking about uh, a utopian future, it's and a and a and a, and a, a greater God whose uh, power is all over the world. It's a type of tzidu kadin. In our psychology, even in times of darkness, we still want to praise God, and therefore, uh, when people were in their darkest times, it gave them consolation to say Kaddish because they were expressing that they still believed in Hashem, they still had faith. In even in dark times, that's one idea. The other idea is that it's a hope for the Mashiach when you're going to have Tchiyat Ametim. The problem with this idea that Kaddish was associated with death or burial or dead people or mourners because of the parts that speak about Mashiach is that 80% of the versions of Kaddish we have from the Geon Egeron, from the time of the Rishonim, 80% of those versions do not have the words Vyatzmach Por Kanei Vikarei Mashiach. For most of our evidence shows that that was not the dominant Nusach. About 20% of the Nusachot had it, but it wasn't a dominant Nusach. So therefore, we can't argue that the elements about Mashiach were the most important elements or in somebody's psychology. What this does show us, though, is that at a very early stage, perhaps already in its earliest form, Kaddish had a lot of variation, just like there was a tefillah of Allah kol yit gadal v'yit kadash or yakum porkan, so too Kaddish probably saw some experimentation and some variation over the generations. This is comes to its greatest conundrum when we when we see the Kaddish de Chadita. This is a famous type of Kaddish, which some people will call Kaddish Hagadol, right? So a typical Kaddish, let's say your Sfaradi, is going to have v'yatzmach porkanei v'karev mishichei. But if a person has ever finished a Masechta or been at a burial, you'll know that there's yet another Kaddish called the Kaddish de Tchadita or the Kaddish de Atid de Tchadita. This is a longer form of Kaddish, which specifically asks Hashem for the revival of the dead, right? That right? Who is going to in the future, and I'm just reading from the end of a, of a Babli Shas here, um, who is going to in the future, renew uh, the world and to awaken the dead and to bring them to the Chayel Elam Haba, and who's going to build the city of Jerusalem, and to put his uh, sanctuary in it, and who is going to uproot idol worship from that land, and who is going to place the worship of God into that place and uh, King and and uh, what's it called? Reign as king in with his with his sovereignty um, and in his glory. This is the much longer form of Kaddish called the Kaddish de Tchadita or the Kaddish Hagadol, for to, to to put it simply. This is a much more expanded version. So 
let's for a second discuss this ex- most expanded version, which actually talks about Tchiatam 18. What are the earliest places we see that this Kaddish is used? Because if we're going to discuss, if we're going to find out how Kaddish got associated with the dead, maybe we should look at this Kaddish, which actually talks about the dead and actually talks about Tchiatam 18. So let me share my screen with you. Um, let's see if I can do this. Share a screen. And let's look together. This is a slide of Rabbi Disola Pool, who wrote one of the best uh, books on Kaddish. If anybody's interested, we discussed a little more last week. But let's discuss one of the earliest sources for the Kaddish Litz, the the, the, the Braita in Mesechet Sofrim says something very interesting. In the time of the Amorayim, especially of Eretz Yisrael, there were me- very peculiar, uh, to us at least, very peculiar burial rituals and bereavement rituals that people would perform after a person passed away. In other words, when a person, uh, when when a group was going to bury another Jew, the rituals surrounding the burial were much more elaborate than Jewish rituals today. These involved a, something called the shura, which is like a row of people standing and sitting and standing, then sitting, sitting then standing in order to comfort the person. The, per, the, 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 the mourner would pass through this row of people. It includes a whole bunch of brachot. Um, and the Gemara in, in Ketubot of Chetam Ubeit even mentions that, that you would have 10 people for the ceremony and you could do it all seven days of the Shiva if you had Panim Chadashot, just like by Chatanim, just like by Hassan and Kala, you need Panim Chadashot. So too, with their ceremony of the Shiva, you could have Panim Chadashot in order to continue these. What, what are called birchot ha'avelim, the brachos said by the mourner. This is a very obscure area of Jewish history, a very obscure area of, of Jewish law, but these are called the birchot ha'avelim. And uh, one could find it in, in Shinai and Vav in, in the Torah and a couple of sources, Masech uh, it's found in Seder of Amram has a version of it. Uh, there's, uh, it's in Yerushalmi. There's, there's a few obscure, Tesefta, of course, there's a few obscure sources who speak about these birchot ha'avelim. So one of the aspects of the birchot ha'avelim, the brachos set over a mourner, is discussed here in Masechet Sofrim. So let's read it together. It says, When the, when the mm-hmm. temple was destroyed, That after the destruction of the temple, uh, and this is referring to some paragraphs before about how people would about how people would visit weddings or visit, uh, uh, what's it called, mourners, uh, Avelim. It would say after the, the destruction, when things changed, they did it a different way. This is this is how people would visit the mourners and visit the chasadim, right? They would they would ask that the chasadim and Avelim should come to shul on Shabbat in order so that people can do favors for them. Chatanim, why would the the grooms come to the to the to the to the uh, shul on Shabbat? The kalasan will have a talent b'dehen in order to sing their praises and to escort them to their home, right? Like a chassan, they're going to make an eifer for the chassan. Um, Avelim, why did they bring the Avelim to the shul on Shabbat? Laachar sheig mora chazan tefila after the chazan will finish the prayers. And some versions have shel musaf. Uh, probably this is the evening prayers. However, holech lo laachurei dalte shel beta knesset. Oh, b'fnei knesset. Right, they bring him to the back of the shul. Some say to the front of the shul. Um, the reader, the chazan, will go to the front of the shul or to the back of the shul to meet the mourners, the avelim. Um, and he would go to separately uh, fulfill the obligation of prayer for those mourners themselves. The Omer Aleim Bracha. He will say a bracha for them. We assume this means the berchat havelim. And afterwards, after he says the berchat havelim for them, Omer Kaddish. He says a Kaddish for them. Now Mesechat Sofrim says something fascinated. Omer He does not say the longer Kaddish called Alma Dati Lechadeta. Ela ala tamud val hadrash. The only time you're supposed to say this is not for mourners. It's not for people who are uh, thinking about death. This Kaddish was designed for the end of st- a study, meaning <laughs> this is one of the earliest versions, according to the to Masechet Sofrim, if this is to be believed, and this, this version of Masechet Sofrim is early, of to, early enough to know what it's talking about, then this, what we have in the Kaddish de Atid is one of the earliest, um, is one of the earliest versions of Kaddish, and it's not impossible 
that Kaddish in its fullest form originally had the paragraph of However, once it got transplanted to the liturgy, they took that part out because it wasn't for the liturgy, for the tefillah, you don't need the part about Mashiach. For the tefillah, you just need the part about praising Hashem. So it's not impossible that this is the fullest version that at least from the, the evidence we have in Sofrim, that the, the Kaddish that we say by Isiyam used to be the original Kaddish set at the end of studies. It's an, this is a, a very probable uh, uh, hypothesis that to, to suggest that this was the earliest, most full study hall Kaddish, or the part of was one was also a relic of, of this fuller version. And when it got transferred to the liturgy, they took out this messianic part because it was not, you didn't need a messianic doxology because you were not finishing studies. You were not finishing a sidra. So why would you have to, to, to speak about Mashiach? So this is a very early evidence for what uh, the Kaddish Dati Litchadita is about. The Mesech Sofrim is saying, this is not about Tchias HaMesim. It's not supposed to be said for mourners. Rather, it's supposed to be said for learning. But when the mourners come to the shul, the Chazan says a Kaddish for them. Why? It doesn't say. Maybe it's the Kaddish is to end the bracha, the 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 berchata the the berchata avelim. But um, this evidence tells us that it was said for mourners, but it doesn't say why. Let's fast forward about. This is a, an example of people at trying. I'm trying to show an example here. <laughs> my slide of a shura, but um, uh, that's a little bit uh, a little far fetched for most people to understand the whole the whole affair. Okay, the next evidence we have is Seder of Amram. Seder of Amram is the Seder written by Amram Gaon sometime in the 800s, 700s, or late 700s, early 800s. Amram Gaon here says, uh, before the Kaddish Dalma, or the, the longer Kaddish, Balmahu Dati Lechata, he says, and after they finish the burial of a person, after they say the section called Tzidu Kadin, Omer Hashiach Tzibur Yitzchadav Yitzchadash Merba, Balmah Duhu Tzidu Tzchadita. Fascinating. A complete 180. Rabbi Aram Gaon is saying explicitly that Kaddish Dama Be'alma Huda Atid Litchadis, that the Kaddish Hagadol should be said uh, over a burial and should be connected with, with dead people and with death and with dying. For some reason, this is only said by the Kura, but this is the earliest evidence we have of a Kaddish being said in relation to burial or in relation to death. This is, this is one of the earliest sources. Now, fascinating is that only 50 years later or so, maybe less, Rav Sadia Gaon, who, who took over in in, um, in in Surah, I believe Surah Padita, he says the exact opposite, and he echoes what it says in Sofrim. He says, and when he's talking about Berkat Sotorai, he says, Avalim hayu asar lomdim. If 10 people are learning in a study hall, Yomru big omram, they should say when they're finished, Baruch HaLokein, Ushbar Nochvado, etc. V'Kadish, Yitzkadal, Umosifim, and then they add, Etc., etc. He gives his new sach of it. And then he says at the end, there are some people who started saying it after the burial, but that's not really the original purpose of it. Meaning, Rav Sadi Gon doesn't like this. Yes, he heard about this minhag. Yes, it was popular in the time of the Geonim. But academically speaking, this is not really what it's designed to do. So it sounds like Rav Sadi Gon is telling us a very valuable piece of information. That the Kaddish da, be, de, uh, Hagadol was originally for the study hall, and it only got transferred to the burial places, to the cemetery, because of its uh, of its association with Tchiat Hametim. But he doesn't he doesn't uh, well he criticizes it, but he doesn't say it's us to do. He just says this is not the original purpose of it. Fascinating. So here we are in the 800s, seeing our next stage in the evolution of Kaddish and its association with death, burial, and, and the dead. Let's move on. About 100 years, we have a Kleinimus Bar Meshulam. Uh, this is a Kleinimus II, whose son was a Meshulam Hagadol. He lived roughly in the year 950, and he was brought from Italy to Germany by one of the, ki the kings of France, either Charlemagne or, or King Charles the Bold. Fascinating fellow. If you, if you want, there's a Wikipedia article on the Kleinimus family. And there's a lot of research done on them. Regardless, Rabbeinu Klonimus, one of the earliest Rishonim, wrote a tshuva where they asked him about saying Kaddish by a cemetery. And he says as follows, Kaddish b'shura, to say the Kaddish by this uh, ceremony called the shura, right? The, the row of people uh, comforting the mourner. Whether or not they said all those pesukim and the brach of tzidu kadin, it's a beautiful thing. 
There's no prohibition to say it. Even if you're going to say it for a person who isn't Jewish, which is amazing, right? He says you could say Kaddish for a person who is not fully Jewish. Who follows the faith. Omrim Kaddish v'chein katfu mevesifta, and this is what they pask in the yeshiva in Babel. Incredible. So we see here another source from the 10th century, before the turn of the millennium, that Kaddish was being associated with burial. So this is where we're up to historically, and we're moving, we're moving in the right, uh, in the right direction here. So all of this is real nice if you are trying to understand the Kaddish of. What's it called? This is all really nice if you're trying to understand the Kaddish as the Kaddish ala Kfura, right? This, the Kaddish of the of the burial. So we see that before the turn of the millennium, somehow Kaddish from the study hall became associated with burial and with the Kfura. But how do you make the next leap that the that it shouldn't be said to comfort the mourners? Rather, it should be said by the mourners to comfort themselves or to assist the dead person. So how do we make that leap? So let's begin with something the Mach says in the 11th century, in the in the 10 hundreds. The Mach is a work of halacha written by Simcha from Vitre, who was, uh, Vitre is a place in France. He was one of the Tamidim of Rashi. In the original version of the Mach after Arvit, there's the following instruction. After Arvit, it says that Thurman Hag was to say Pitumak Toret, after Arvit, which is uh, famously done by the early original versions of uh, Minhagim of France and of Ashkenaz. After Arvit, every night, they would say Pitumak Toret. Then the instruction comes, and I, I want to read it to you verbatim because it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I can't even share my screen. Might help. Here we go. Yeah, I can share my screen. Give me a second. Sorry for anybody listening. The Omed Hanar. This is after Pitu Maktoret. The Omed Hanar. The Omer Kaddish. He says Kaddish umedaleg titkabal, and he skips titkabal. In other words, he says half a Kaddish. The Omer Yehi Shlama, but he just says not really half a Kaddish. He says Yehi Shlama. Says the Master Vitri, clear, black and white. The Kaddish ze. The reason the 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 young the the kitanim the the youngsters right the minors say this kaddish is not for any real reason. It's not because they want to uh, be mighty anything. They're only doing it to teach them how to pray, and it's not counted as one of the seven kaddishes that we're supposed to say every. Day now, why does he have to point this out that it's not a halachic kaddish? Because the 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 Brayta Masechet Sofrim in Tedzayin says explicitly that a kaddish is that a that a katan a minor is not supposed to say kaddish. So it's coming and saying, no, no, don't worry, the minor is not saying a kaddish, which actually is halachically effect uh efficacious. We're just doing it because it's cute. We're doing it because we want to teach the young people uh how to daven. Very nice minhag, very cute minhag. But there's no explanation as to who whose brilliant idea that was this. And what's interesting about the earliest sources about this French minhag is that the earliest sources call it Kaddish Katan. They don't call it Kaddish Yatom. They call it the Kaddish al the Kaddish of the young people. It was a didactic practice, a minhag done in order to educate the kids. Just like we say, we make the you know, the Moroccans they sing Yigdal Elokim Chayv Yid Kadash. If the if if there was if there was a Katan there for Arvit, so too. Would they make them say the Kaddish to teach them how to uh, how to how to pray? But if you fast forward about 50 to 100 years later, after the death of Rashi, um, already in the generation of the Talmidim of Rashi's uh, grandsons, like one of the Talmidim of, of, Rabbi, of Rabbi Nutam, Rabbi Yitzchak uh, Ben Dorbello, he writes some glosses, some additions to Master Vitri. And in the Sidur HaRokeach and in the Orzarua already, this is uh, about 100 years after Rashi, we find a completely new curveball where they no longer call it Kaddish Kitanim, they call it Kaddish Yatom. Why? This is the Kaddish of the Yatomim. They give a story. They say, well, in France, they say, the France Minhag is, the French Minhag is that they'd let any kid say it. doesn't matter who. Just so, any kid will say it in the shul. doesn't matter if he has parents or not. Our Minhag 
is to only select the boys who are yatomim and 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 let them say the kaddish for their uh, for their parents. Why? Because of this midrash, and they go off and they and they tell the story, fascinating story. This is a this is a midrash from Kala Rabati. Kala Rabati is a brayta which has some sections which are really early from the fourth century and some sections which are really late from the Gaonim. So this, and if anyone's interested, it's in Kala Rabati Perik Bet. Uh, Brita Tet, Brita Two Nine. So in Kalarabati, there's a famous midrash which is so famous, it's been called the the Maaseh Tana Imhamet, the story of the Tana and the dead man. And I think we've 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 recalled this this midrash before, but it's been told so many times in so many different versions that there was a scholar named Rela Kushlevsky. She put together seventy different versions, and I'm not kidding. 70 different versions that she found of this midrash with an analysis of each one and its evolution over the past 1700 years. Regardless, what's the story? The story is that Eitana, probably a probably a Akiva, but it's sometimes also a Biochanan, is walking down the road, uh, meaning some sort of meditation, and he meets a man who is dead, right? He's walking through hell, uh, whether he's meditating going through hell or he's meditating going through some sort of path or a road in heaven. And he meets a man. The man is running down the road and he's in different versions. He's carrying a great burden or his face is black or he's covered in excrement, all different versions of it. And he asks him, where are you running? And he says, don't make me tarry. I am being punished. I have to go pick up all this wood every day and then I take it back and then they burn me in hell and then they, then they, they do it again every single day. And, and my uh, my uh, what's it called? My superiors are going to be mad if I if I if I run away. He says, wow, you have such a terrible punishment. Rabbi Akiva asked the man, how bad were you? What kind of person were you? And he says, oh, I was terrible. I was a parnas. I was the head of a uh, tax collection for a Jewish community. Or other versions were that I did every sin imaginable. And there's no hope for me. So Rabbi Akiva said, really? There's no hope for you? Can I do anything to save you? And he says, no, this it's impossible. The only way to save me would be... Sorry. The only way to save me would be if, if I would have had a son then maybe if the son would would pray for me or say baruchu then i would be able or in some versions of the story if he would if he would get up and, and be say maftir in some versions of the story if he would get up and say baruchu then i would be able to be saved from Gehenna. Rabbi Akiva goes down to the earth he finds the the man's town and he finds out that the man left a pregnant wife he asks about the man everybody says he's the worst thing that ever he was the worst human that ever lived he finds the wife he finds the child that was born after the man's death he rears the child. He gives him a bris milah. In some versions, the kid didn't have a bris milah. And he teaches him Tyra until he's able to say the Kaddish. Uh, sorry, say Barhu. And when he says Barhu, the man is let go of let go of Gehenna. Now, there are many different versions of this story throughout the generations. What's important for our purposes is that, that the earliest versions make no mention of Kaddish. The earliest versions are much less descriptive. They don't have, you know, the excrement on the face of the person. They don't speak about uh, the uh, thorns on the person's head. They don't uh, They don't call him a parnas. They don't go into detail about what sins he did. The earlier, ver if you study it philologically, um, the earlier versions are more pristine. However, this has not stopped scholars from studying all sorts of messages from this Midrash. And every generation had a different version of this Midrash. And this is what gets hysterical because... If you look at the versions that the Hasidi Ashkenaz had available to them, the versions that they had available to them are very much uh, elaborated by the scribes, and I'm saying that with some jest, where they describe the person who is uh, who is running down this road, this person in hell, they describe him very much like Yeshu. Like all the Hahu Gavra, right? They, they, they use all the words, seches, that he has thorns on his head, uh, they say that he um, that he's going to be in Gehenna forever. Um, a lot of allusions and uh, a lot of very uh, different allusions to to Yeshu. Miraculously, somehow Yeshu gets out of Gehenna. But regardless, their version of the Midrash is kind of funny because of um, its anti-Christian its anti-Christian leanings. Regardless, what they do with this Midrash is they say that this Midrash proves that a person can. Uh, a person by saying Kaddish can can uh, rescue somebody from Gehenna. 
So their versions included Kaddish Ubarhu, because as I mentioned, Kaddish and Barhu got always were always put together. People always, would never just say Barhu, they would say Kaddish Ubarhu. So in their minds, a Katan or a Yatom could say Kaddish Ubarhu and then release their parents from Gehenna and that had some sort of enormous power in Shemayim. That was the view of the Hasidi Ashkenaz. One second, I'm sorry. That was the view of the Hasidi Ashkenaz that um, uh, that had this heritage of this story. For this reason, they say our practice of making the Atom say the Kaddish is probably the correct practice because it has such an effect in Shemayim that it can rescue people from Gehenom. Um, one second. I just have to help somebody get into the to the building. Somebody uh, trying to get into the building who cannot uh, can't get in. Okay, so where do we move from here? So first of all, we have to address the elephant in the room, and that is that the core theology that you can do something to save somebody from Gehenna is kind of troublesome. Let's look at this Gemara in the Yushal, in the Yushalmi. Like Marlon Yishami says as follows, Amr B'yechanan, ki mi asher yichubar, yivchar ketiv, ela, kol achayim yesh pitachon, shekol zman shadam chai yesh lo tikva, met avda tikva to, ma ta'ama b'mot adam rasha tove tikva. Says B'yechanan, who is it that has been connected? It is written he may choose. All living beings have the certitude that as long as a human is alive, he has hope. When he dies, his hope is lost. What is the reason? When an evil man dies, hope becomes lost. The Gemara is saying explicitly, that so long as a person is alive, he is able to do teshuva. So long as a person is alive, he's able to improve his lot. He can do things that are great for him, that can benefit him. But once he dies, there's nothing he can do for himself. Once a person dies, what are you going to do? He can do nothing for himself, nor can anybody do anything that'll help him. There's a few makayres in, in um, the Ushami. There's a few makayres in the Midrashim that show that the view of many of the Tanoim and many of those who were in Eretz Yisrael seems to have been that it's not possible for a person, that it simply is impossible for a person to change anything after they died. And this was pointed out by David by, by David Brodsky. He points out that many of the earliest sources uh, that come from Eretz Yisrael seem to not like this idea that you could do something to affect someone else's lot. He did what he did during his life. And that's it. Like, now he's not alive anymore. How could you improve his situation in heaven? The amount of mitzvahs you did and the amount of errors you did are judged on a scale, and that's it. It's finished. And and it's interesting. If you look in at the in uh, the Yerchot Chaim, he quotes a tshuva from Rav Haigaon, and they're talking about tzedakah and Yom Kippur, where people give tzedakah to benefit the mit. Rav Haigaon essentially says that if you're praying or giving tzedakah to, to help a person have his judgment uh, lessened, that uh, Hashem shouldn't judge him so harshly in, in Shemayim, yeah, maybe tzedakah or tefillos can help for that. But to give a guy more schar in Shemayim, no, you're giving tzedakah, it's you who gets tzedakah, it's you who gets the schar. You can't give tzedakah for somebody else. You can't give tzedakah and give somebody else schar. It's like you're going to put on tefillin for someone else. You're going to put on tefillin for somebody who's dead. How does that work? So uh, tangentially, what Brodsky wants to do is he wants to show that the Talmud Bavli holds very strongly that a, that a son can uh, it says, uh, uh, or we say, that the Talmud Bavli shows and, and believes that a son can affect and can help the father. The father who's dead uh, cannot help the son. A father cannot change the lot of his son, but a son can help can, can help the lot of his father in Shemayim. That's his view he holds. And I, again, I don't agree with it fully because he tries to say that that uh, all of the sources from Eretz Yisrael seem to say that this is impossible. Only the Bavel, only the Bavli holds that it's possible. And and his argument is that the, that in Bavel they were influenced by the Zoroastrians who believed that a son, if he's a minor, uh, a son would be able to uh, what's the word? A son would <laughs> would be able to affect things for his father. But with caveats, only if the son is doing a peshlucha shalah. Like if the father leaves over tzedakah that the son is supposed to give, or the father instructs his son to do mitzvah, uh, mitzvahs in, uh, after he dies. If the son is doing things for the will and the commandments of his father after the father dies, then the Bavli would believe 
uh, in his view, based on the Zoroastrian influences, which I, I'm skeptical about, he believes that that the Bavli um, would believe that a son can influence the uh, the the lot of his father in heaven and perhaps take him out of take him out of Gehenna. Mm -hmm. So. Again, I'm very skeptical that that uh, these parallels are so striking that you could say, especially the Chazal, uh, first of all, that the Bavli and the Yushami argue in this regard. And second of all, the Chazal would have taken anything from from a, another religion. Uh, I, I just I don't buy it very much. I really don't buy it. And um, for, for a bunch of technical reasons. But if you're interested, check out Brodsky's article on this. It's David Brodsky. He has an article about this. R regardless, uh, I think we've gone on a tangent uh, on that regard. Um, moving forward a little bit, in the time of the Hasidic Ashkenaz, in, um, what's it called? In in Germany, they brought a few riots from Gemarot in the uh, and they which is, of course, Eretz Yisrael in nature, and they bring a couple of other proofs that he atone and a, and a, and a, some that that the living can provide atonement for the deceased. So that was their view. Some have tried to say that well, that's also a hashpa because in medieval Ashkenaz in the in the 12th century and in the 13th century, they were all mushpa from the Christians around them who began doing all these kinds of rituals on a person's death on their yard site. They were doing prayers. They were doing masses for the deceased, and people were doing. Uh, people believed. That there's uh, the belief of purgatory, which is an in-between place between hell and 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 heaven, uh, got to to this ex uh, was starting to multiply. So perhaps the Hasidic Ashkenaz were also just following uh, these trends. Again, I'm skeptical. I know there is a zeitgeist over there. I don't think there's direct borrowing between the yard site. I I I I, I again look at the, uh, David Shaivitz has a has a great article. Going through all the all the uh, the um, the Makairis in uh, this is David Shaivitz. I forgot where he published this, but he he published an excellent uh, piece on comparing what's it called the Hasidic Ashkenaz uh, and the and the and the the in France as well as the contemporary ideas about Gehenna. So what do we have? We have that we have a situation now. We're holding in the 13th century uh, already the, where the Minog spreads from France to the Rhineland, to Italy, to Spain, to Yemen, all over. Eventually, it doesn't take long for this minug of the Kaddish Yatom to spread like wildfire. And already by the 13th century, um, Rabbi Yaakov Stahl found in the, I think this was the, the library in Moscow, or where was this? I wish I had it in front of me. I'm sorry. He found two chuvais from the Roshanim obscure Rishayim, but he found two Chuvais from the 13th century already, where they have a Shaila that was brought to them, um, that was brought to them, where they asked, can a grandson say Kaddish for his grandfather? And if so, does he have Kedima? Does he have precedence over a child? Right? A fascinating thing that already 100 years after uh, Rebelezer Akeach and Yitzchak de Orbello, you have the Minog being so established that grandchildren are doing it and that there is you know, questions of precedence in the shul. There's questions uh, by the Maril's time. You have questions, people asking, well, uh, how long do you say it for? Do you do it for the Shiva? Do you do it for 30 days? Do you do it for 12 months? Like, how long do you do the Kaddish? And all the halachis begin to get developed. The Maril is the first uh, place to really go in depth and, and really study it in depth. But that's the the general uh, the general leaning. It, it spreads like wildfire, and it spreads like wildfire quickly. So... I don't believe personally that it spread like wildfire because of conceptions of purgatory. That doesn't sit well with me. And I don't think that that was so heavy on people's consciousness that they needed to do it, to do it that way. One very popular theory, of course, is that it spread like wildfire after the Crusades, meaning after Rashi already passed away and there were so many orphans in the shul, the the preference to give this minhag of saying the Kaddish to the orphans, especially because the parents just died and people felt bad for them, and there were so many orphans, became the dominant minhag and therefore became associated with the Asomim. And, and from when these kids grew up, they still said the Kaddish for their parents, and it became an idea that people have to say Kaddish for their parents. And I, it, it goes without saying that eventually the minhag spread from Kaddish to Kaddish and Baruch Hu, from Kaddish and Baruch Hu, it spread to the entire chakras, <laughs> and from chakras, it spread to you know a person davening three times a day. So that's that's 
it goes without saying that that's how that that's how that evolution uh transpired okay now it should be noted that up until the medieval times we find a uh, up until modern times meaning in the medieval times the conception of saying kaddish was changed let's first start for the mourners by the burial right that's first or for the mourners in the basic nss then it goes on to be used as a kaddish um yeah first a Kaddish by the graveside. Then we have also a Kaddish in the shul for the mourners. Then we have a Kaddish at least one time. Then we have a Kaddish from little kids. It turns into a Kaddish for Yitomim. Now, this Kaddish, the idea of it, becomes a Kaddish done not for the mourners, not for the burial, not on the not not to remind us of Tzichias HaMesim. Rather, the function of the Kaddish becomes a magic thing where it's going to save pe people from Gehenna. But in the modern era, once you cross over into the 15th century and the 16th century, a sharp change happens. And that is that the Mikubalim get involved. Once the Mikubalim get involved, a very big change in thinking happens about the Kaddish. Because the, because the Mikubalim dis, disagree with the Hasidic Ashkenaz. And to generalize, what, I'm gonna, what, what I'll say is that people like the Arizal say that the Kaddish is not to save somebody from Gehenna. Rather, what the Kaddish does is that it elevates people from one level of Ganeid into a higher level. If they're on one lower level, they go to a higher level. This brought a sharp distinction between the Minhagim that evolved in Ashkenaz versus the Minhagim that evolved in Spain. At first, there were Paiskim in Spain who really didn't like this. The, 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 the Sephardim didn't really like Kaddish, and not all Sephardim said Kaddish Yasom. That's because Paiskim like the Abu Durham and, um, and the Beis Yosef didn't really like the whole idea of Kaddish Yasom because, you know, bringing, you know, the, this chus of taking someone out of Gehenim didn't really sit well with them at all. Rather, now that there's this new idea that you could give them a higher level in Gan Eden, it becomes much more positive. So the Ashkenazim, for example, wouldn't do it on Shabbos because there's nobody's in Gehenim on Shabbos. They wouldn't do it for 12 months straight because they didn't want to show everybody that, uh, you know, the person's in Gehenim for 12 months. Rather, they do it for 11 months to make pretend he isn't in Gehenim. All sorts of different uh, clever tricks to associate Kaddish with Gehenim. Well, the Sephardim would do Kaddish on Shabbat. The, the Sephardim uh would, would could do it for 12 months the, the sardim developed a whole bunch of different minhagim because for them it was much more positive and for them uh the the meaning of the power of kaddish took a different form and i want to discuss many more of those developments uh, next week and the next week sure as as well as how these changes in the different minhagim changed in the modern era that's what i want to really do next week as to how the kaddish atom as to how the kaddish atom evolved the last thing I'll mention is my own theory. And this you could take with your own grain of salt. But some people have tried to say, of course, that the Kaddish Atom has spread because of the Crusades. Some people say it became very popular because of shifting ideas of purgatory. Some people said um, it became popular because of the printed book, which I very much doubt because we find we find we find this. You know, we, we find this minhag spreading like wildfire. My own theory is that the, the if you're going to find the real source for why Kaddish became so popular is you simply have to look at the at the core anthropology of it. You have to look at the core psychosocial benefit of Kaddish. And the truth is Kaddish works. Kaddish, as described by people who study uh, the who study bereavement rituals, is a bereavement ritual. Every single culture has a has a rich set of bereavement rituals and when kaddish got added to our set of of bereavement rituals it was found to be extremely powerful originally our bereavement rituals consisted of the shiva and the kura and the kriya and all of the the various uh the shura all of the rituals up until that point but there was something special about the kaddish something special about this bereavement ritual which really really spoke to people and really connected people both to themselves both to the community and both to the shul my opinion is that the psychosocial benefit of it was what i'm going to just pause the recording because we're doing kaddish give me one second okay let me just oh boy Okay, resume the recording very quickly. So let me just quote for you a couple of one piece from from people who have said Kaddish for people that they lost 
and explain to you the power that Kaddish has. And if you look at my screen, this is a quote from a person writing an essay about how they said Kaddish and how it affected them. So this person said, strangely, I never made peace with the words. The Aramaic felt like shards of glass in my mouth, sharp and a little dangerous. Yet my life revolved around it. I rarely left my neighborhood, tethered as I was to my home, where no one looked at me funny or showed anything but respect for my daily presence. Even on days where I could barely put one foot in front of the other, I dragged myself out of bed and into the community of worshippers at 6.30 a.m. and then back from Mincha and Meyer Bay, heartbeat later. Even when all I wanted was solitude, the meager warmth of my aloneness, I had to venture out, and on some level, this saved me. Essentially, what he's saying, sorry, she actually, to be honest, um, what this person is saying is that the Kaddish is a is a bereavement ritual which speaks to people on very deepest levels and uh, anthropologists love shiva anthropologists and and psychologists love shiva and they love all the jewish bereavement rituals because they work and here's just one excerpt here from here's one excerpt from a uh, i have to speak lowly because they're they're starting to pray but here's just one excerpt from a portion of an anthropology paper the Jewish morning rituals and saying Kaddish in particular create a rhythm for the year of mourning. They establish a new routine that replaces the one that included the deceased. People feel that it connects them to the deceased, to their family and to the community. Standing to say Kaddish signals to the community that the mourner's life has changed and reminds those around them that the bereaved need support. The rituals create a space where grief is not only acceptable but expected, a regular reminder to the bereaved that they are not supposed to be over it yet. In particular, many feel a, a sense of camaraderie with the other mourners. The daily or weekly minyan becomes a grief support group, a place where people understand what the bereaved are going through as, as those nearing the end of their year welcome those with newer losses. Um, essentially, what I'm trying to say with these excerpts is that even Goyim, even, even non-from Jews understand that Kaddish has the power for a person to work through their grief. It has the power to help people through the year of Shiva. It has the power to help people internally and individually navigate grief. And it also has the power to help people socially and as a community with their community to navigate grief. And it's, it's a very beautiful power that makes Kaddish Yatom so powerful. Um, thank you for your attention. I have to hang up now because we're starting... Uh, uh, what's it called? We're starting our beat. So I'm going to end the, the recording now. But thank you to everybody for your attention and your time. And I'm going to pause the recording now.